How's it going, everybody? And welcome to part two. Part one, you are achieving full board awareness. You are increasing your own self-awareness on this spiritual journey. Part two, you are going to achieve full board nirvana. That's right. I guarantee it, as long as you follow the exercises and push yourself with the training methods I've laid out. So as I said in the first video, before we get into what exactly this random configuration of pieces means to us, in the first video, your visualization skills are more than just your ability to calculate I go there, he goes there, I go there, he goes there. Having strong visualization skills will help you to increase the depth of your ability to calculate concretely. But I believe that the best way to learn how to calculate concretely is to solve positions that push your limit as far as the difficulty level, and you just try to solve them and you work on it. Now, your visualization skills are your skills and muscles that keep track of the pieces at the end of these long lines, the ability to see the position five or six, seven, eight moves down the road as if it's right in front of you, and ultimately, your ability to do this on a very high level, like playing blindfold chess, if you want to know how to do that, and your ability to keep track of very long variations in preparation, right, like you see strong players do. So we talked about all the basic building blocks necessary, and I'm not going to repeat everything you learned in the first video, because I'm assuming you've watched how to achieve or increase your full board awareness in part one. Now here, what we're going to do is work on the training methods I told you my coaches gave me, and the difficult, I believe, Soviet method exercises that you can do to push yourself. This first one here is an exercise that was given to me by Grandmaster Gregory Kaidanov, now a fellow Chess.com video author, at a training session called the U.S. Chess School, which is a training session that takes place for the brightest and best young Americans. Usually two or three times a year, they're actually sponsored and hosted by Greg Shahad, who's also the founder of the U.S. Chess League. He's kind of a chess entrepreneur, if you will, and does a lot of great stuff. But when I was young and actually good, which I'm not anymore, I had the honor of attending these things, and I remember Gregory talked to us about this particular exercise. What is the goal of this position, and how does it work? Well, the goal is, and here are the rules, you need to move your knight to every square that is not attacked by the queen. So any square that is attacked by the queen, such as what you see here, you need to get to every square that is not attacked by the queen. But in getting to every one of these squares that is not attacked by the queen, I'm just sort of highlighting squares that aren't attacked by the queen, you are not allowed to ever cross a square that is attacked by the queen. So what are the rules to the game? You have to move the knight to every square that is not guarded by the queen, but you're not allowed to ever move the knight to a square that is attacked by the queen. So in order to get to, let's say, c1, you are not allowed to go to b3, because that's off limits. So what is the only square you can use to get to c1? e2. You figured it out, right? You are not allowed to get to e1 by crossing d3, but you can get to e1 by crossing c2. Now, this exercise is actually very difficult to do it correctly, and again, like many of the basic training exercises you learned in part one, it's probably best done with a training partner. Unlike the basic exercises of knowing the board, it's probably best done with a training partner who actually knows some about chess. But I would believe that uh, for many of you ambitious chess players out there, even if you have a private coach, they may not even be aware of these exercises. So you can talk to them about it and tell them the story behind it that I'm giving you, and they can help you do it. So the idea here is that Gregory told us that this was an exercise given to him and I don't remember all the details, so maybe people can send a message to him, or maybe he'll watch the video, and I'll ask him to comment on it. I don't remember who exactly it was, but I want to say it was Grandmaster Dmitry Gurevich who owned the record for doing it as quickly as possible, which I'm pretty sure was around the low three minutes, under four minutes. And so we're going to put the time on the clock for me, and we're going to see if I can do it. Now, you have two ways to do it. At first, you can not necessarily consider the exercise failed if you happen to make a mistake of crossing through a square. We'll call it Ghostbusters, crossing through the streams that are actually guarded. And you can just sort of zap yourself with an electric shock and, and move back and try again from the square you were at without ruining your progress. Or eventually you can get to the point where if you make a mistake, the exercise is considered lost and you do 15 push-ups or you have to give $5 to whoever you're training with or you find some sort of motivation. But the goal is, even if you do it, 
you can always continue to do this to get better, even for really strong players, which is why I said even many of your coaches might need this. Why? Because you can always try to beat your time. And even if you achieve a great time, you can know that the best in the world were able to do this with just a few minutes. And I'm sure that there are super talented guys who could do it faster than Dmitry Gurevich. I'm not sure they ever did these exercises or not. But it's an exercise that, again, will show your ability to keep track of everything in your head. And of course, if you're doing this at the board, are you allowed to move the knight along the way? Of course not. You have to do everything in your head. And so I'm going to try to do it by actually just highlighting and drawing arrows to the squares I'm going to. Why am I going to do it that way? Because if I just said the squares, we might not be able to keep track of it. You guys may not trust me not to cheat, and who knows. So I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible, and we'll just time me. And I might mess up. I actually haven't done this in a while, but I'm pretty sure that when I did it, I had it around four minutes and maybe even just under. So I was pretty, pretty good at it, and I worked on it a little bit to get better and better at it. But this is a fun exercise, and we're going to try to do it real quick. So let's see. About to get to a mark right here, and we're just going to say, ready, set, go. You guys can keep track in terms of the minutes on this video, how quickly I was able to do it. So let's do it. So C2, A3, B1, C3, E2, C1. Now you'll notice, and I'm going to have to teach along the way so my time doesn't count, that in order to do it, you kind of have to go back squares, right? So I can go back to E2, C3. I can go to A4 now, B2. And I believe I got all the squares in this area, but I ruined my arrows, didn't I? So let's do it again, starting over. Ready, set, go. C2, A3, B1, C3, E2, C1. Now when I go back to the squares, I'm going to highlight them. E2, C3, A4, B2. Looks to me like I got all those squares in that area. So now I'm going to go back to A4. I'm going to go to C3. And, oh no, from A4, instead of C3, I'm going to go back to A4, I'm going to go to B6, C8, A7, back to C8, E7, and I'm going to keep going, G6, F8, H7, F6, E8, C7, A6, and B8. Now I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back to A6 and go to B4, then I'm going to go to C2, then I'm going to go to E3, I'm going to go to F1, Oops, so then we're going to go ignore that diagonal, G3, E2, F4, H3, F2, G4, H2, back, back, H3, G1, back to E2, to C1, oh wait, I already got C1, so we go to E2, we go back to F4, we go to G6, H4, go back to G6, and we go to H8, then we go back and we go to E7, we go to C8, we go to A7, which is one I'm pretty sure I didn't get, we go back to C8, E7, G6, F8, H7, F6, G4, H2, F1, and let's see, I didn't get actually, I have to go back to G3, E2, F4, I have to get to E1, and I have to do it quickly, how can I get to E1, I have to go to, oh wait, I already went to E1, that's right from here, so it wasn't highlighted, but if I'm not mistaken, and you ignore things like where I cross through H1 here, that's only because the board has to draw the arrow that way. If I'm not mistaken, I just did it pretty fast, and I'm not sure that I get to H6. If not, I have to go back. I have to go to G3, F1, H2, G4, H6. And again, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I got to every single square, and I did so pretty quickly. Now, given I believe this was a little bit easier for me, considering that I was drawing arrows and I was able to keep track of where I was going, and so having somebody test you by keeping track of the squares you've gone to on a clock or marking them off when you go there, but also somebody who's a good enough player to sort of zap you when you break the rules. And, okay, if I missed one, you understand the idea. So you can do this again without the kings on the board. Did I ever get to E8? I was on F6, so I definitely could have got to E8. And I did. I went this route. That's right. To get all of those squares, then I have to go back. You go back. You go back. And you go here. And then you can go to H7, F8, G6, E7, C8. A7, back, go to B6. So you can get to every square. You have to do a lot of rerouting. And for me, I've done this a few times, so maybe that seemed a little bit easier, but try it yourself, and you may be surprised in terms of how tricky it is to not do it without getting zapped and how to do it quickly and do it accurately. So let's move on to the next exercise that you can do here. Okay, this next training position, and again, you can ignore the kings. They're on the board because the board setup won't allow a position without kings because it's technically not possible. Here, this is one that I believe was given to me by Yermo, but possibly not. Maybe this was also Grisha Gregory Kaidanov. Maybe he also gave me this one. I don't remember. I think it might have been in the U.S. Chess School again. 
I remember Boleslavsky being a Russian grandmaster who was referenced as being able to have the record at this position as far as keeping track. But this is difficult, and this one never ends. So this would be difficult for grandmasters and for anybody who hasn't worked on this or even people that have. The basic rules to the game, and here are the bullet points. You set up a position at first with two pieces, okay? Then you can build up to three, four, five, six, seven, and again, I believe the record was 12, and you're going to see the rules to the game in a second. But you start with two pieces, and in every position, you have to name the piece that is protected by another piece. If there is no piece protected by another piece, you say pass or you say none or you say go, you just tell the partner to go again. Now, this unfortunately is very advanced training, and this is designed for people who are probably pretty strong players and already have the ability to do a lot of this stuff on their own as far as all the things we've talked about in the last two videos. So in this first position, what would we say? We would say rook on g3. And that's all we would say. Now, again, I'm recording this without coordinates. We only add the coordinates later in our, in our video editor, believe it or not. You can see coordinates right here on the side of the board. I can't see them. So I also, again, practice always without coordinates. And at this point, it's not really relevant. But if you ever find that you're keeping notation in a tournament game and you need the coordinates to write it down, well, then, as we've said, there's something wrong. You really should be the point if you did all the exercises in the first one. That should be a trigger for you to know that you're on the right track if you're at a point where you can keep notation and track of things without the coordinates being there. So here we go. In this position, you would say rook on g3. And then the person actually moves the piece. Actually, they don't move the piece physically. They move it mentally. They say rook to g6. And so you would say pass. Because with the rook on g6, nobody's protecting each other. Then they say knight to g5. And so what would you say? You would say knight on g5. Because the rook on g6 is protecting the knight on g5. And you just move there. By the way, at this point, the pieces are not in their current setup. What you see here is only because I'm not moving it. But the way the exercise works is that you set it up to the position. And you have to name every piece that is currently protected by another piece, every piece. And as the exercise goes, your partner suggests a move, and you have to once again name every piece that is still protected by another piece. So again, to show it more clearly, let's add another piece. So in this position, here's what we're going to do. I would quickly say rook on g3, knight on e4, and then white moves rook to c3. Now we would say rook on c3, knight on e4, bishop on c6, because all three pieces in that position are actually protected by another piece. Then we say the move rook to c4. So we would say bishop on c6, knight on e4. Then I say rook to a4. We would say rook on a4, knight on e4. Then we move rook to a1, and we would say knight on e4. Then the knight goes to f6, and you would say none. Then the knight goes to d5, and you would say knight on d5. Then the rook goes to a8, you would say knight on d5, rook on a8. So notice I'm not drawing as many coordinates to show you guys that right now this is the current position. The position you see here is not the current position of the exercise. The position is with the knight on d5, bishop on c6, rook on a8, okay? Now we keep doing this, and of course, as you can imagine, we add another piece. Take a look at that, right? So now what would we say? We would say knight on e4, rook on g3. Those are the only two that are protected. Then the rook goes to g7. You would say queen on e7, rook on g7, knight on e4. Then the rook goes to g8. You would say knight on e4. Then the queen moves to a7. You would say knight on e4. Then the knight goes to c3. You would say none. Then they say queen to g1. And at this point, you have to keep track of the fact that the rook is on g8. So you would say rook on g8. Then they go bishop to d5. So you would say rook on g8, queen on g1, and bishop on d5, because the knight on c3 is protecting that bishop on d5, right? So notice we're having to keep track of where everything goes and you can continue to push it. The goal is you should be able to keep track of, once again, 20 to 30 plus movements, like we did in the other ones, do it 20 to 25 times. You should be able to keep track flawlessly of 20 to 25 movements in your head without your, without your partner believing you made any mistake. And if they're also trying to work on their skills themselves so they don't trust themselves to be able to keep track of it and let you know, they can write the moves down. So imagine you're sitting at a board and the initial position is set up and every move they say they write down so that then when you name the pieces that are protected, they can concur with what the actual movements have been and kind of quickly tell you, okay, yes, yes, yes. And at first it's easy. You start with just a couple pieces. And if you do that 20 times, you move it up to three pieces, four pieces, five pieces, and onward and onward. And if you get to the point where there's a ton of pieces something like this, it might be incredibly difficult. So here you would say rook on g3, knight on a4, rook on a8, and then white plays bishop to g7. So we say bishop on g7, rook on g3, knight on e4, 
and rook on a8. Then they play rook to a7, and you would say bishop on g7, knight on e4, rook on g3. Then they go rook over to a3, and you remember the rooks are attacking each other. So you say rook on a3, rook on a7, and the bishop on g7, which is still protected by the rook on a7, and the knight on e4. And they say these quickly, and you have to keep track of where everybody is. And this is easy, because I'm sort of moving them to squares that are consistently attacked. But when they really try to get you messed up, is when maybe they make several moves to get everybody on a square where it's not actually protected or attacking anything. And then they start to move them back to squares that are protecting and attacking, and you have to remember where everybody is. And they're not in the position, of course, where they were currently set up. So once again, this is an exercise you can do to keep track of your ability to keep track of moves as they're being made. The idea would be that you should be able to see everything clearly, and you want to get to the point where probably, even saying the record of 12 would sound silly, because I believe that the best players in the world would probably be able to keep track of everything the whole time, and even grandmasters. I think that if I was focused, I could do this for a long time too. But maybe if you add other factors like a clock or how quickly they can get to more pieces and how quickly you can do it in a row, like when you get to 20 times, you add a piece, and how quickly you can get to higher numbers without messing up. It's a good exercise to help you work on these skills, and beyond the next few points I'm going to give you, which is mainly a speech I'm going to give you and just another practical piece of advice like I did at the end of the last video, this one, along with moving the knight to squares and timing yourself and trying to get better, are two really good exercises that will push you to work on your visualization skills. Okay, so that said, let's just bring this to a close here and just give you a quick summary. The other main ways... If you've worked on all the basic building blocks of the first video, and then maybe you do these exercises here, the other main ways to improve your visualization skills are practical ones, and they require discipline and honesty with yourself. The first one I would say is to review books, and as I quickly mentioned but said I would expound more on in this video, review books only moving the mainline moves on the board and everything else being done in your head. Now what exactly do I imagine when I say that? Let's say you're going over a game from the French defense book, or it doesn't matter. You're going over a famous game from Capablanca's Chess Endings by Chernoff, or Understanding Chess Move by Move by John Nunn, or whatever. And so we get to some position here. I'm just, I don't know why the uh, Poison Pawn variation of the French is on my subconscious, but it is. So we get to some position like this, and we talk about this position here, with all of White's options here being... Knight takes c3, queen takes c3, h3, g3, rook to g1, and bishop to e3, I believe even 13 rook b1, all being mainline moves, okay? And perhaps you're going over a book, and instead of the game just continuing down main lines, at this point there's some analysis, and they maybe give some analysis on the other moves that weren't played. If we say knight takes c3 is the main move, there's some variations given on the other options. So here, instead of getting confused or trying to make all of those moves on the board, I would often try to just analyze all the sidelines in my head, which of course was recommended to me by Igor Ivanov and Yermolinsky, my Soviet trainers, and they're not special. Many other trainers would say the same thing. And furthermore, if you can actually do it, it's a little bit more efficient, because if you can actually do things in your head, then you save a little bit of time over just moving all the pieces on the board, having to set back up to this position on move 13, and then moving all the pieces in the board again uh, in the other line, and then going back, and you've done that several times, you've already spent you know 45 minutes, and you haven't even gotten in the main line yet. So if you can actually calculate things in your head, you're also being slightly more efficient in your study process. But what I would say beyond that is that just like a real game, you can't. there's no trial and error. There's no process of elimination. You can't try, move, and see if it's bad. So you should try to treat all studying as if it's your own game and try to analyze the variations of those critical moments where there are different options in your head. And so if I said that instead of knight takes c3 and you see that the author says there's a note and it says bishop to e3 can be met by knight to f5, bishop to f2, black castles long, rook to g1, black plays d4, white plays g4, the black knight comes to e3, white takes e3, black takes with the pawn, and maybe give some evaluation of the position where they say, I was just giving a variation of the bishop e3 line, which is possible, and they say something like, white is better because he will pick up the e3 pawn before the c3 pawn, or something like that, and maybe give some sort of description about the position. So your goal now is not only should you have gone over those variations in your head, which also improves your concrete, I go there, he goes there type of calculation skills, but the second goal of this exercise, and this cannot be cheated on, or this exercise is not helping you improve your visualization. You have to agree with their evaluation. 
So let's say you're going over a game from a book, Understanding Chess Move by Move by John Nunn. Great book. Lots of great games. I highly recommend it. There's some pretty hefty analysis in there. And if at the end of a variation, John Nunn says, and white is clearly better because even if it's something obvious, like black is losing a rook or the rook can't get out. If you can't see that in your head, if you can't see that position clearly enough to agree with his evaluation, then guess what? You do it again. And you do the same thing. You go bishop e3, knight f5, bishop f2, castles long, rook g1, d4, g4, knight e3, takes, takes, and I give some random evaluation. Okay, you see what I just did there? How did I get better and better at my blindfold skills and my ability to visualize? I was a perfectionist. So when I would sit there and study, if I analyzed the line and if the end of the variation, the author gave an opinion that I didn't agree with or I didn't understand or I couldn't see what they were talking about or all of the above, I would go over the line again in my head to make sure that I could see it clearly. And if you do that several times and you still can't get to the point where you see what they're talking about, Then you make the moves on the board, and only then. Now, I've done this with people, and they say, well, I can't even get there. I lose the variations after a couple moves. Well, here's the advice for that. If it goes like this, because we'll do the same line so you can see the repetition. If you go bishop e3, knight f5, bishop f2, castles long... Wait a second, I I can't follow it. Okay, so let's see. Bishop e3, knight f5, bishop f2, castles long, rook g1, and uh, I'm already getting foggy. Let me do it again. Bishop e3, knight f5, bishop f2... Castles long, rook g1, d4, g4. Okay, the knight gets to e3 and takes it. That's already weird for me. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? Do it again. Bishop e3, knight f5, bishop f2, d4, rook g1, castles long, g4, knight. So you see what I just did there? I just went over all the variations again and again and again in my head. And as I've said, you have to learn to crawl before you can walk, right? Or you have to learn to ride a two-wheeler before you can be a circus tricycle. I actually don't even know if that theory is tested or proved, but we'll just assume that I'm right for argument's sake here. The point is this. No, all kidding aside, the point is this. If you analyze variations in your head and you can't do it, well, you can give up and just start moving the pieces on the board and say that Danny's crazy, this is too hard, or I just don't have the talent, whatever. Or you can trust me that I believe it's a muscle that can be built. And so you do the line and you do it a couple moves. And if you lose it, you back up and do it again. Then you back up and do it again. And you know what you end up doing? You slowly break the roof off. Every time you go over these variations again and again and again, you end up breaking the roof off your own limitations. And you build the muscles in such a way where all of a sudden you are calculating lines that are much deeper than you were able to do even a month before. So I feel like, you know, I'm giving you guys all this priceless piece of advice and I almost feel like I shouldn't even be doing it. I literally believe in that strongly that this can improve your calculation. I'm serious, that if you can work on this, I've given you lots of exercises in the basic training blocks. But analyzing books, you can also do this analyzing games. You know, you find a game online, print it out. If you're saying, I don't have books or I can't afford it, well, obviously you're watching this video. Go print out some games and go over a game and try to do it in your head. And if you lose it after five moves, do the first five moves, do the first five moves, do the first five moves until that position is concretely seen and visualizing in your head. Then you expand it a couple moves. And guess what? You'll lose it after seven moves. But do you give up? No, you do it again. You go over to move seven, move eight, move nine. And if you continue to push yourself in terms of how you review analysis, you will eventually be able to go further than you realize, okay? So reviewing books, reviewing your own games, reviewing things, and not giving up when the position gets foggy is the number one key. And and we haven't even talked about variations within variations. If we're talking about bishop e3, knight f5, bishop f2, and not only can black castle long, black can also play d4 right away. Then we have the line to consider with d4, knight takes d4, knight takes, bishop takes, knight takes, and then white castles long, or then black plays bishop c6. Or I don't know, something. And so there's multiple variations within a variation. The same rule applies to all those. If you can't see the position clearly evaluating, you've done it five or six times, then you're allowed to move it on the board. I'm saying that as if I actually have control over you, but if you want me to, I will. Okay? It, once you've done that, then you're allowed to move it on the board. If you're doing it before then, before five times, then you're cheating. And you're not pushing yourself. And so what's the problem with this? And other students have said the final issue. You say, well, Danny, I just spent hours on one game, and I used to go through three games in Zurich Chess International or Understanding Chess Move by Move, and I did it in an hour. Well, you probably weren't really getting much out of it, were you? Oh, ding, 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 right? Well, now what I'm doing and the way I'm talking about this training method, even strong players can go over games that are quote-unquote beneath them beneath their level of understanding, and get something out of it if you do it in such a way that challenges you. Make your practice harder than your tournaments, and your tournament play will get better, okay? So the final thing, the final goal of reaching your full board nirvana is once you've done that for even, let's say, six months to a year, and you've really gone over some great chess books, and please don't email me with 100 requests for a great chess book list, 
there's lots of great chess books that a lot of people know. Ask in a forum and everyone can tell you. And maybe I'll post an article of my recommended books. But even if I recommend them, I'm sure there's great books that are released every year that I have no idea about. So any book, the bottom line is any book can help you with this if you do it the right way. That's the cool thing. Even if you think it's beneath your level, if you're going over variations in your head, not only are you improving knowledge, but you're always improving and keeping your visualization skills in check. So it helps you regardless of the level of the book. So finally, the last step toward achieving full board nirvana is playing in a complete blindfold game. And the way you do this, I recommend, is the way I did with Igor Zaitsev when I trained with him in Moscow, the late Igor Zaitsev, which was great. He and I just basically did hours where we played on a blank chessboard. There were no pieces, but there were clocks and there were score sheets. So I would say e4, and he would say c5, and I would say knight f3, and he would say d6, and I would say d4, and Chopalicious, Chopalicious, and we're in a mainline Sicilian. And, and he and I were playing game in 15, rapid chess, writing down the moves on a score sheet and playing the entire games in our head. And then we would analyze the entire game in our head. There were no pieces. The entire lessons were constructed blindfolded. So when you at the point where you feel you have that full board awareness and you can play... I don't know, I'm making up the whole Nirvana thing like as if I have this whole thing really prepared. We all know I'm just making this stuff up, right? No, seriously, you know, I'm not. If you can play five complete games with both colors against somebody else who's at the same level and you can make no mistakes when you end up reviewing the game later, at first, what you may have to do is play a blindfold game and keep score and then put the pieces on the board and go over it and see if you guys did it right. But as you continue to progress, you should be able to play an entire blindfold game in your head, keep score of it on a score sheet, and then go over the entire game in your head, variations and all, without ever losing track of the position. Okay? And at that point, my friends, you will have achieved full board nirvana, and I'll give you some kind of sweet little trophy or certificate or something. No, I'm kidding. Maybe we'll go out for ice cream. But in all seriousness, I hope you guys enjoyed this more than the live sessions. I remind everybody, you can follow me on Twitter. And before I end it, I just want to make sure I didn't leave any questions unanswered. I don't think so. That's the full board nirvana is being able to play entire blindfold games in your head and keep track of them and then go over them and prove to yourself that you played an entire blindfold game and you played pretty much as well as you would have in a real game. You want to get to the point where you're not making mistakes because it's blindfolded. You're making mistakes because you just made a chess mistake and that's it. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you can do that, then maybe someday you'll actually be able to play a blindfold chess simul, right? I will see everybody around on chess.com.